Welcome back. So in the last segment, we were talking about how to represent a system that has inputs u and outputs y in different equivalent representations. So if you have a linear system, you can write things as a state space system of ODEs, x dot equals ax plus bu, y equals cx, x is the state of the system, y are measurements, u are the actuation. Uh, but what we're going to talk about now is this transfer function, this complex valued frequency domain transfer function g of s that tells me how u maps to y in terms of frequencies of inputs and outputs. So I call this the frequency domain because this complex function tells me if I force this thing at a given frequency, what is the output of the system, okay? And so the whole idea is going to be we're going to Laplace transform. So we're going to Laplace transform this set of equations, and then we're going to get g of s equals some stuff. Okay, and I'll just tell you what it is now, and then I'll derive it in a little bit. Okay, and this is in the absence of a plus du. If you had a plus du, you would just have plus d. Okay, so first things first, I should probably tell you or remind you what the Laplace transform is. Okay, so let's just take Laplace uh, transform. The Laplace transform is really just a generalized Fourier transform that's valid for functions that might grow exponentially, that might not be bounded at plus and minus infinity. So it's a generalized one-sided Fourier transform so if I have a function that blows up, I can't Fourier transform it. But what I would instead do is multiply it by a sufficiently damped exponential and then Fourier transform it. And that's kind of what the Laplace transform is. So I have a few other uh, kind of video lectures on the Laplace transform that go into more depth, but here I'm just gonna summarize. So if I take, uh, if I wanna Laplace transform some function of time, so let's say I wanna Laplace transform x of t. Okay, so x is some variable in time, t is time. Then this is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity. And I'm going to say that this is the integral from 0 minus. So it starts just before 0, like a little epsilon before 0 in time. Um, mm -hmm. This is a mathematical technicality. And it's this integral of x of t e to the minus s t dt. And so you can tell right away that because I'm integrating through time, x of t e to the minus s t, all of my t's are going to go away and I'm going to be left just with a function of s. So this is, um, we call this x bar of s. Okay, there's different notations. Some people use hat, some people use capital X. I'm just going to say it's X as a function of S now. This is the Laplace transform of X in time, and now it's X in terms of frequencies S. Okay, and so the reason I'm saying that this is a generalized Fourier transform is because a Fourier transform would be something like, let me just write out what the Fourier transform is, and hopefully I don't butcher it. Okay, if I take the Fourier transform of x, um, I'm going to write it as a function of x because it's a little more natural. This would be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x e to the minus i omega x dx. And that would equal f bar of omega. So this is the Fourier transform. This is the Laplace transform. And if I Fourier transform something, I'm basically multiplying that function by e to the minus i omega x and integrating out dx. So that gives me a function of a particular frequency, so a frequency domain representation of f, uh, where essentially I'm decomposing f of x into its different sines and cosines of all frequencies omega. And if I added up all those sines and cosines, I could re-represent that function f of x. So here, notice that if I just take um, if I just take this s and I plug in i omega, I recover something that looks a lot like a one-sided Fourier transform. So that's all I want you to 
to be picturing right now is that this thing looks a lot like a one-sided Fourier transform. And so what this means physically, I want to give you the intuitive feeling of what a Laplace transform means before I, I go into the math. This variable s is now in the complex plane, okay? If I evaluated s at i omega, so if I evaluated s at any location i omega, this is kind of like if I had taken the Fourier transform at that i omega, okay? So these i omegas um, here, but s can also be, it can have a negative real part or a positive real part. And what we're going to find is that if I write my transfer function, so if I say, um, let, me, let me write this out. So if I say the Laplace transform of y equals the Laplace transform, my transfer function g of s times u of s. So I'm going to put bars on everything so it's clear that it's the Laplace transform. So if I say that my output y is my Laplace transform transfer function times the Laplace transform of my input, we'll write this down in a minute, but this is essentially what we have here is that, um, yeah, this is y of s over u of s, okay? So the output y given some input u is this transfer function, and if I multiplied u over, I'd get y equals g u, y equals g u. Then the way that I interpret this uh, transfer function, this g of s, so let's say now I'm looking at g of s, is if I plugged in a pure sine wave, if I plugged in a pure sine wave to this u of s, that would be like an e to the i omega t, and that would be like evaluating my transfer function at one of these uh, points on the complex, on the imaginary axis. If I plug in, and so let me just draw that. So this is like if the input was a pure sine wave, okay? Now, if I plug in for u something that is decaying and oscillating, that would be like evaluating g at some a minus, sorry, minus a plus ib, so, or minus a plus i omega and I'll have an exponentially decaying envelope and the system will oscillate around. And similarly over here, uh, I have an exponentially growing envelope and my input is growing and oscillating. And so notice that the Fourier transform would only be able to handle these pure sines and cosines, but it's possible to represent my transfer function with these exponentially decaying and growing modes also. So for example, in some systems, I'll have an instability and I'll need to have some, uh, a pole or a, you know, an eigenvalue in this right half plane to represent that transfer function behavior. But we'll, we'll get to this, this later. What's important now is that the Laplace transform of a function is, is relatively simple to compute. It's related to the Fourier transform and it gives you a function in the complex plane, okay? So a couple of important properties I want you to remember, um, probably the most important, is that if I take the Laplace transform uh, of the time derivative of x, so of d dt of x and t, this is just Laplace transform of x dot, okay? What does that equal? So if I asked you to compute the Laplace transform of x dot, you should just plug it right into here and try to work it out and see what it is. So let's do that. Let's say this is the integral from 0 minus to infinity of d dt of x of t e to the minus st dt. Now if you want to solve this, we have lots of tools in our arsenal. How do you solve this kind of an, this integral? Okay, so what we usually do is we use integration by parts and we say, well, this part is u and this part is dv. And so if I want to integrate by parts, then this is integral of u dv is uv evaluated at the bounds of integration, so that's zero minus infinity, minus the integral of v du dt. Okay, and so we just have to figure out what, um, so we know what u is, u is e to the minus st, 
if dv is ddt of x dot, then v is just x. Okay, and so I can write this out. Did, did that make sense? So if dv is x dot, then v is just x. So this equals e to the minus st x evaluated at 0 minus to infinity minus, now I have v, which is just x, so that's x integral from 0 to minus infinity, zero, 0 minus to infinity. And now du is the derivative of this with respect to time, which is minus s e to the minus st. So I get a minus s e to the minus st. So my minus s pops out, and I'm going to call it plus s e to the minus st. Okay, we're almost done. Um, all right, so now what, was, what is e to the minus infinity s for any value of s? Um, well, for any, you know, for, for infinite time, e to the minus something infinity is zero. So this is zero at uh, infinity. And if I plug in time equals zero here, what's e to the zero, that's just one, times x of zero is x naught. So what I get is uh, zero, that's when I plug in infinity, I get zero in this exponential, minus x naught plus s, this whole integral here is now just the Laplace transform of x. So it's s times the Laplace transform of x. Okay, so this is a really, really, really nice property. I'm going to write it down one more time and just summarize. If I have the Laplace transform of x dot, it's equal to s times the Laplace transform of x minus initial conditions. Okay, really, really, really nice. So this is one of the main reasons why we like thinking about things in the Laplace transform transfer function domain is because things like derivatives just become uh, polynomials essentially in S. So I go from a differential equation to an algebraic equation when I evaluate this in the Laplace transform domain. Okay, so the last step I need to show you is essentially let's derive this transfer function from this. So we're going to take the Laplace transform of this star equation. Okay, so let's take uh, Let's take the Laplace transform of my star equation and see what it gives. Okay, so first things first, let's take the Laplace transform of the, the first equation. And this is really, really simple. So Laplace transform of x dot is s x bar minus x naught, okay, equals Constants and matrices just pass right through the Laplace transform because any if I had this a times x, that a could just pop out front. So I have a times the Laplace transform of x plus b times the Laplace transform of u. And then if I Laplace transform this y equation, I can get um, Laplace transform of y equals c times the Laplace transform of x. Okay. So all we need to do now is solve for x bar here and then plug it into here. And we'll get an expression y as a function of u. So let's do this. Uh, let's bring all of my x bars over to one side. So I'm going to have s x bar minus a x bar. And because this is a matrix A, I'm going to say this is the same as s times the identity matrix. So this is s times the identity matrix minus a x bar equals b u bar plus my initial condition. Okay, And I'm going to keep my initial condition around just so you can see how it enters uh, into the system. Okay, So this is x bar equals all of this stuff. And I can solve x bar of s equals s i minus a inverse on the left times b u bar plus si minus a inverse x naught. 
Okay. Now this SI minus A inverse is a little bit of a funny object. We're going to see um, pretty soon that if I if I take a simple second order ODE, this is going to be a second order. This is going to be a fraction one over a polynomial in S, where that polynomial is the characteristic uh, the characteristic equation of my matrix A. So this thing has roots. If you notice, this is kind of like the eigenvalue equation. This thing is degenerate. This thing, 1 over s minus si minus a, blows up to infinity at eigenvalues of a. So si minus a is degenerate exactly when s is an eigenvalue of a. And so this is actually 1 over the characteristic polynomial of a. It's kind of interesting. Um, for now, I'm just going to assume that we have zero initial conditions because usually what we're doing is we're considered with the steady state behavior after the initial conditions have died out. So the last thing I have to do is take this expression for x and plug it in here for y. And so I get y bar of s equals c times si minus a inverse times b times u bar of s. And what you'll notice here is that this whole thing is just a function of s. That's my transfer function. And what this does is it tells me if I have a Laplace transform, if I have some input u and I can Laplace transform it, I can tell you what the Laplace transformed output is by just multiplying these two. Okay, so that's really really nice. Remember, if I had um, solved this in the time domain, there would be some weird convolution integral that tells me what y is as a function of u, and that convolution integral is difficult. Here, it's really really simple. If I can Laplace transform the input. I can find the output by just multiplying with the transfer function. And then I can inverse Laplace transform to get y of t. Okay? So we're going to get a lot into the physical interpretation of what this means um, later. So you're going to have um, interpretations of g of s. So if I plug in, for example, a sine wave for u of t, that's, I'm going to evaluate g at i omega. And that's going to tell me what my output sine wave looks like. Okay, um, that's one interpretation. If u is an impulse, so if u is the impulse response, I want to whack this thing with a hammer and see how it responds, then u bar is just 1. That's a really nice property of Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of a delta function is the constant 1. And so essentially, if I want to know the output to an impulsive input, all I have to do is inverse Laplace transform my transfer function. Okay, so I'm going to write that down. This is really important. So the impulse response, uh, I'm going to say this is y of t given u equals delta t is just equal to the inverse Laplace transform of my transfer function. Or said another way, my transfer function is the Laplace transform of my impulse response. If I collect data, I whack my system with a hammer and I watch it ring through, if I can collect that data and I can Laplace transform it, I get an approximation of my transfer function, which is pretty useful. This is actually something that people do uh, for system identification. Okay, so where this is going, we have different representations for our system. We can represent our system as either a state space system, or a frequency domain transfer function, and they both have different nice properties. So here I can look at eigenvalues and eigenvectors and stability, but it, we're going to find that in the transfer function domain, I can look at properties like robustness and sensitivity and how the system handles different types of noise and disturbances. And this is a very graphical, intuitive uh, way to represent systems that complements the state space approach. So we're going to be using this to design controllers and then tell if they are or are not robust. Okay, thank you.